So this is the very first episode ever of Psychological Painting, which is a work <laughs> title that we just came up with. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really happy to have uh, with me for the first ever episode, first ever guest is Fred, who's on Instagram as Fred Agni. So Fred is a multi-talented creative doing circus performance, uh, fetish related performance, he went to art school for painting, um, all sorts of different things. And we're going to be talking about, about Fred, about their creative work, and then go into a mental health topic, the psychological painting part. Uh, which is going to be about uh, family relationships, difficult family relationships, and how Fred has been navigating that and, and a bit more. So, Fred, thank you for being here. Hello. Hey. Hey. Well, technically, I'm not there. But Where are you? I'm kind of in Thailand, uh, which is pretty nice. I have some goats in my backyard. <coughs> and um, the pollution is really great. Well, thank you very much for braving the air pollution in order to talk to us today. And I'm sorry that Thailand is <laughs> the paradise. Although it's okay, it's a fight I have to deal with every day. <laughs> Another reason to wear a mask <laughs> as well. Yeah, you know, uh, Thailand, wearing masks before it was cool, you know, it's yeah. a thing. <laughs> Ahead of the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's... Oh, Corona? Yeah, we we're already prepared for it. I think it's actually why Thailand's got so little cases for it, because it's kind of, at least here in the north, it's quite normal. And yeah, I think, that's like you know, a lot of, there's a lot of jokes Thailand. going around about painters and about how painters are constantly in quarantine isolation all the time anyway, so nothing's really changed for us. We're just at home alone painting. So it sounds like it's similar for Thailand, like they're kind of over there, like, what are you talking about? Everything's normal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everything is normal kind of here. It's, there's less restaurants to eat food from, but the world's pretty chill. And there's like a curfew, but I'm still in a village. So the policemen are pretty chill about this, I think. Interesting. And you're in Thailand for circus, right? Originally, yeah. So there's like a large community here um, of flow artists. Uh, if someone doesn't know what flow art is, basically it's like circus art but with props, like it's prop manipulation. Uh, and the main theme here is like there's a really good space uh, for people to come and play in um, and have an audience. So you can actually perform here with medicine circus, uh, something that a lot of people have worked like build and I began to be part of like last year when it's really starting. Uh, people come and go um, and shows get built and it started off just like a group of people just like jamming and like people would come and watch and now it's like a a proper full-on show you know like there's actual acts and there's like a setup and there's like an MC and there's and yeah it's, you it's are really beginning to take shape hmm? how many of you are there well, that's the thing, it kind of keeps changing. Right now, here, the people that have stayed here, so that's actually kind of the cool part, you know, the world's been closed down, and we have this community here. Uh, although the circus part is obviously not going on because social events are closed down. Uh, there's probably like 30 of us here. So it's, it's a nice um, place to be, to be surrounded with people that do very similar stuff to what you're interested in. What is your circus practice? Like which, which circus skills you do? What other kind of creative things you do? Uh, I mean, everybody does fire. That's the main thing. Um, I guess my main prop would be kind of hoop and double stars. Um, and then I kind of dance. This is not really a prop. I use like hand torches and stuff, but um, I, yeah, I have a show with my partner. It's just a very nice, place to be able to practice and like level up you know with the audience you start learning what the audience likes or not things to change and yeah but the main thing is that you can be really creative and keep changing and playing with new things here how does it make you feel when you're doing the circus flow do you get the psychological flow when you're doing it um yes and no it's very it's very up and down. I don't think, I think it's a bit like, I guess, meditation sense. Like every time that you meditate, you don't actually 
necessarily meditate. You know, you might just get brief moments of it. But sometimes you really get it and you're like, oh, yeah, that's really worth it. Mm. Um, I feel like there's since this unspoken side of it that people don't really talk about. It. It's like, it's not you just get into the flow. There's a lot of training, you know, that really should be involved in this. Um, but for me, dancing thing. usually gets me into the flow. Like, non-thinking, just movement that I feel confident in and stuff. That, that feels very flowy. That's great. I like, I just got a pole for pole dancing and I started doing dance classes before quarantine because I think there's really nothing like being in your body. And I think it's so different to other creative practices because you're getting that, the joy of like sports and exercise and moving everything it really like, but I really think it brings together like mind, body, spirit in such a wonderful way that I've like very late in life come to see the magic of man. Yeah, I, I very much feel this like a, a difference when you're performing to when like you're playing just by yourself, sort of thing. Um, I definitely get a big high also out of performing, but this like getting out of your, out of your brain a little bit, you know, like this peace thing and like getting into your body. Yeah, I think anything can fulfill that as long as there's some kind of movement. Another thing that you do that I would describe as creative that I think is really fascinating and to me it, it influence, seems to influence how you live your life is that on, online you're always asking these really deep but sometimes quite silly philosophical questions with people and it gets a lot of engagement like just uh, you asking these like various questions about life. And it's something that I don't see a lot of people doing is using social media as a way to deep dive into this, into those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I, yeah. For this, this is really playful for me. Uh, I definitely enjoy diving deep into topics and conversation and stuff. But there's always the downside that a lot of other people don't enjoy this, uh, and it can be like quite threatening. Um, so I decided instead of just like making statements uh, about things, it would be better to just like ask people what they think um, about these things. And I, I said to do this on social media because I'm sure like every single human's got to one point and you're like, I'm just gonna delete Facebook. It's just full of shit. I don't even like using it anymore and stuff. And I was like, I, I'm at this kind of point. And then somebody said to me, it's like, well, I just use it how I want to use it. And it's like so simple in the sense of just like, oh yeah, I don't have to do, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what everybody else is doing. Yeah, sort of thing. Like, what do I actually want? I'm like, oh, I want interaction between all my groups of friends that come from very different aspects. And I want interesting conversations to happen from here. Um, and that was something I was very much able to control. So it's like, okay, let's see how it goes. And it's not like, oh, let's see if I can get like 40 people to answer me this. It's more like, okay, I, I'm th I've been thinking about this thing. Let's uh, blurt it out. Sometimes I take a little bit longer on like really rephrasing it because I'm trying to like get a point and an idea that I've been playing with uh, out there. But sometimes it's really just like, how many types of the color green can people name? Like before we start like making up new greens, it's fun to think, uh, but it's also fun to just p playful without having to want to come to a conclusion to anything. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's that mixture of the of the deep and kind of intellectual with the silly playfulness that I see in a lot of what you do, and that's that's very strongly comes through the questions, but also a lot of the like some of the performances you used to do would kind of mix a silly playfulness with a sexiness. Like I'm thinking of a clown, a sexy clown. Yeah, I definitely like those two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like nothing should be taken maybe too seriously. Uh, at least definitely feel like that about my questions and in my performances. It's just, I guess there's just a natural part that just comes out of me. I'm like, oh play and silliness yeah and I feel like kind of like in stand-up comedy by using the vehicle of playfulness and, and jokes or silliness 
you can actually get to some really difficult topics to talk about because if you just went straight the serious route then it's quite it can be quite quite difficult for people whereas i feel like comedy or silliness you're able it's like a it's a safe door to enter into something like that yeah i think it's very much about how you make people feel about this certain topic you know it's like it can be deep and painful but also if you get the chance to look at it from a different perspective where you kind of laugh at it but you realize like oh wait i this is also a valid point um then people become a little bit more open-minded because they're not presented with this you know full box of negative emotions hitting them in the face it's not like this is always going to be negative mm. That's interesting. I feel like that segues quite well into the what we're going to talk about in terms of mental health. Um, difficult conversations. Let's move on to a difficult conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so difficult family relationships. And for you, that's been your relationship with your birth mom. Um, so I want to yeah. throw it for you to uh, begin. So tell us a bit about that. Um, I guess it kind of starts with her having a difficult life um you know she was uh into drugs for a long period of her life um and this obviously caused various difficulties and then she had me quite young um and she also grew up in a in a country that was like much more conservative in spain it was just after franco and so she was quite rebellious and yeah, all of these things uh, make it uh, maybe not the most suitable mum. I don't want to say a bad mum because she has also like a really great qualities. But uh, it's, it's probably not people's idyllic picture of what like a parent, a supportive parent should be like. Um, and it, you can always take it back to like, oh, where does this come from? Why does she still take a drug sort of thing? It's like probably her childhood and my grandma her mom being like also having a difficult life and going through a lot and having pain and as far as i know um it goes back to my great grandma's great mother grandma yeah great grandma's great grandma so great 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 grandmother of just basically abusiveness of just going down the line just passing on bad behaviors or survival that i guess were helpful in some kind of way but really they're quite damaging um yeah and people talk about the, point, the cycle of abuse right and when you are able to yeah yeah cycle, it's because it but, it's like you're saying it's it's this this negative behavior it comes from somewhere and i feel like you're already at such an advanced level of processing to be able to move past the kind of anger and resentment or whatever other feelings that come from someone who's been abusive towards you and to already yeah. be thinking like so we're talking about you and like how this affects you right and your first the first thing you say is about empathy for your mum and I think that's really quite an amazing place to start from in terms of the conversation is that you're even taking I would say I didn't start from this place no way like it just takes a lot of like practice and like looking at things from different ways <laughs> it all starts from a lot of anger and i think I got, probably a lot of people don't want to admit it but a lot of like wanting revenge and wanting this person to just be you know the right person for you and wanting somebody else to fix all the problems that you feel you're kind of having and yeah it's like you know what it feels like if somebody just come and like push you originally uh, when your child sort of thing is just like annoyance and anger and like all you want to do is for them to feel the same uh, or maybe to like distance yourself and I definitely went through all those processes of like hatred removing myself from the situation not wanting to look at it um, reacting badly to it uh, using the same coping mechanisms that they kind of went through um until we're getting to a point of just be like oh wait it's down to me how i feel about it oh that's amazing and even through that stage i've just been like but how how do i do that <laughs> how, 
how can I not be angry at this person that did this bad thing? Um, it's definitely a long process. I mean, I wish there was like a hijack, you know, like a shortcut to this stage. I would definitely just like hand it out, you know, like free candy on the street. Just like, take this! <laughs> this is a cheat code. I spent the last 20 years working out mathematically how you can be sane. And now all you have to do is just like, dance around naked in the full moon <laughs> and paint your body in gold and you'll be fine. <laughs> and I'm sure there are people out and, uh, there claiming that that will, that will do it. And I'm sure that kind of could work. You know, like, that's the main thing. There isn't like a formula for everybody because everyone's individual experiences with like abuse is, is so different from each other's. And I think that's what makes it really difficult to talk about because my experience with like an abusive family is very different to somebody's who might have like an alcoholic parent and I'm like oh yeah they're both drug abusers sort of thing and so there's those similarities but like one could be very mental the other one could be very physical one could be like really outwardly uh, expressed the other one could be very manipulative and like you know it's it's hard to to know what's the kind of right solution mm. it's like any therapy um they say with like phobias there's like different ways of curing a phobia and one of them is like slow sposha therapy the other one is just like diving deep and one finding out why you actually have uh this uh phobia in the first place and none of them are like secure uh to give definite results especially if you let's say don't go through the whole process which i think is very difficult for some people and mm. it's easier to just like maybe it's not worth it maybe it's okay i would just have a phobia of water for the rest of my life yeah so it's just was, tough to kind of decide I was, I was thinking when you were saying i wish that there was a, a shortcut a cheat you could give someone it, to me immediately i think of therapy as being that's the closest thing we do have to any kind of cheat of the mind of a of a just tried and tested system. But even that, like you were just saying, it isn't it isn't perfect. It's gonna be different for everyone. Things it might not work, people might not be able to stay the whole course, everyone's different. So um but what do you think for you was what were some of the influential things that helped you on your like path of recovery? Um so one thing that I think made a really good uh, impact on me was having good influences around me. So seeing good role models, um, having other people that I could see what things should kind of be more like. I mean, this definitely helped me at the beginning to fuel my anger of like, oh, you know, my parents shouldn't be like this. They're wrong and they're bad and sort of thing. But first to understand it, that okay, these things were kind of wrong. Um, the, the second thing was like being at the right time to be able to confront it uh, because for a long time, you know, I wasn't really strong enough to just accept it. So it was easier to just push it away. So in my particular case, I just didn't speak to my mother um, for like four years because I was like, nope, it's like too shit. Like this is unbearably painful i can't deal with this so i'm just mm. gonna run away and is it the best tactic yeah maybe not sort of thing but like i definitely wasn't ready to do it then and i definitely remember it being suggested over and over again you know like good influences in my life sort of things like i probably should try and fix this and fix this didn't mean like changing my mom sort of thing but like changing my relationship and how i felt about her mm. uh, but I was like filled with this, like the world is unjust and it shouldn't be like this. And like, you know, people should be responsible uh, for being better people and I shouldn't have to work to help them. Um, so taking my time actually uh, was kind of helpful. Would I have liked to like work through all of this faster sooner? Yeah, of course, you know, hijack, but uh that was kind of helpful and then and then seeking help for myself definitely therapy this was also very 
good step for me. But there's the difficult part uh, in the therapy session sort of thing of just like getting the right therapist. I think that's quite a like, you know, lottery chance of getting the right person that can see you for what you need at that moment in time. Because there's so many different tools and so many different methods to work through these things. You know, they don't know you, they don't know what's helpful sort of thing. So they're just playing around of like, I'm just feeling around what you're saying and possibly this could help. And that is a common thing that puts people off from therapy is that, oh, like how, like how many people are you going to have to see until one is the right fit? When you're already in therapy and it's not quite fitting, the idea of having to go and find another one and then maybe that one won't fit either. That's like often quite a challenge for people. Yeah. And, and it's expensive as fuck. It's not just like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go try this, this sports, this gym, you know, which is, might be like, uh, I'm, okay, I'm comparing to European Spain prices, but you know, like 30 euros a month sort of thing. And then I get a month of trial out sort of thing. It's just like, it's expensive per session. I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but uh, it's quite the commitment. Um, to commit to something that down a month down the line you might realize oh shit this wasn't right for me yeah, yeah. I knew- and i think financial investments for these types of things when you're not sure about it can be very difficult for people to commit to yeah i think i know like obviously everyone is different but i know that for me because i changed therapists a couple of times and i use talk space so they do the matching for you so there's not a lot of work there's not really much work in terms of looking for somebody who's going to fit you they just do it but I yeah. still I still change and I do get frustrated with one of the therapists that I had and I remember at the time having these same reservations and thinking like oh like the time and the money that it wastes and like having to catch up on the next one but like eventually I did find that the work that I did even with the therapist that was wrong we still did a lot of work that was then useful moving forward um, so it might not have been like the most efficient way of doing it but it was still progress it was still moving forward and i think for a lot of people just the act of going to therapy and seeking support it's such a huge step that even if you don't get the right fit one two three four times you're each time you're moving closer to the right the right way for you and i think that's a really powerful thing that even though it is it's understandable for it to be off-putting and scary it's really wonderful that people still keep moving forward with it yeah, I think it's like anything, you know, like if where you're at right now is not working for you, trying out different things, it's just like, you know, you're trying to lose weight. you got to try a few uh, different methods of exercising or eating well or anything you, that is suggested to be helpful sort of thing to find out what actually works for you. Yeah. You know, this very rarely that you just like land across the the perfect solution first because I also went through like various uh, therapists and, and I had a huge gap of just like maybe seven years of just not going back and it was only something like a quite harsh um, uh, event that really pushed me off like I really need to do this like um, had I not had that event and maybe I would have never come back to it um, but yeah throughout the the process of trying and trial and error you do actually learn something from it it's not just like actually fully wasted time but i think that's the belief system that your brain works from of just like wasted time and money this is stupid like nobody can understand me better than i can understand myself but uh, actually (laughs) it's not that they can it's just like they're good at drawing a picture that you can then navigate because I know that you, you're, we've talked before about your therapist currently, you love her. Oh my God, my therapist is the best human in the world. I, I have almost the worst problem of just like, I want her to be a best friend, but also she is amazing and I don't want to seek out another person to help me with these problems um, so I can have this person as a best friend. It's, you know great therapy problems they're real <laughs> that's the yeah, other yeah, thing no, I'm your therapy isn't right for you or they're so amazing that you 
like want to be their friend instead of them be your friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just like, can can we like clone? This is why I'm so up for cloning. You know, like then we can all have everything. <laughs> I think I want to yeah. go back a little bit to something you said earlier about time, because I think that was really, that really struck me as about how a lot of things in life, including like mental health processes, but just anything that we do, it takes, it takes time and it's often about having the right timing as well. And um, I, I think you said, I wanted to call you, call you back from, because you had a critical word of yourself in terms of like, how long it took you to reach to a point and I wanted to I wanted to be able to say like no don't criticize yourself for that like, everything comes at the right time but I can't remember what the word was but anyway um yeah I thought that was just the I reason. very very much agree on this of like we all want quick fast solutions like this magical formula that, that I want to just like give to everybody you know the hijack of getting there um but no uh, things take time and for a reason um I, I definitely it's one of my difficult parts of just like but I want to do this faster like I know I can do it so why, why can't I just not concentrate all of it in one go uh, your brain doesn't work like that you know like when you practice something a day a technique of anything or maybe a painting technique or like a juggling technique or uh learning new vocabulary new language at the end of the day you've kind of got it but it takes a night to sleep on it for the next day to be like oh now it's like integrating at least you know um, yeah, definitely i think all the time about whenever i do have light bulb moments of development or recovery it's always something that I've heard or read a million times before. The information is not new, but it's just that it's because of the right time, because of whatever's going on with me, now it's being internalized. Now it's making sense. I know something I really struggle with. I'm just like, wait, I understand all the theory now. Can, can I just be okay? Like, I get it. You know, it's not, it's not hard. It's just very simple. Like, for me, I, one of my eureka moments was working out how to get out of depression or like how to never like fall back into it was as simple as like wait I just need to get out my house and see people and eat well and exercise but I've heard this a million times before like what yeah but there was like a different level of understanding it I was like yes I know this on a theory level but on a practice level it hadn't really integrated because I didn't really understand it so I didn't really do it but as soon as I started doing it, it was just like, oh shit. It's like showers. Yeah. Showers are still like this magical thing for me of just like, yeah, you know, they're great. You feel great afterwards sort of thing. But like every time like I take time to give myself like a proper shower, like coming out of it, I'm like, I'm just like a new human. It's like I've washed my insides and my thoughts and like I'm fresh to start a whole new life of positivity. Yeah, but it takes a while to to see those things because I've been showering, you know, all of my life, and I didn't get it. <laughs> and I hear these people say these things. I'm like, what kind of crazy stuff are people making up that showers, you know, fix your mood? What what relation is there? Or what scientific evidence is there? <laughs> so, no, so I think you're right. Thinking about that, so what if? if you were speaking to either your former past self before you'd been through a lot of this development in terms of how you cope with yeah. your mom and the, and the trauma from the experience with your mom, um, if you could talk to your past self or with someone who's going through that right now, what do you think is helpful for someone to hear if, if it's not- well, Definitely shower more. Like, <laughs> um, I think, hope you know letting people know that what they're experiencing now is just now and they don't have to be scared of the next moment i think that fear basically rules in the worry that it's going to be like this for a long time and that worry in itself just like cultivate this feeling of negativity um that isn't useful so giving somebody hope of just like 
it's not going to be like this forever. It's actually not going to be like this maybe in an hour. Mm. Um, it's every moment is kind of different. You might just walk down the street and see like uh, somebody fall over and just, you know, start laughing like crazy. Mm. And now you're going. <laughs> maybe you were supposed to push them. Like who knows? <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? I didn't actually tone down my example for what came originally. <laughs> I was like, uh, maybe that reveals a little bit too much. About me, but then Germans have their word for them for this, like Schadenfreude. So yeah. maybe we should accept that it's okay to laugh at other people's pain. And the Which Germans is maybe the comedy strong. comedy that we need. Yeah. No, I I, I yeah. knew where you were going. Yeah, I, it's really easy to just be like, I'm stuck in this, and fully yeah. believe this. Um, I feel and. That. Years don't have to pass by before you have your next happy moment. You could be depressed, but you could watch a stupid film and laugh. And if you become aware of that, it's like the first step of just like realizing like, hey, I'm not stuck in this. I'm not this label. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that because I think things can be very painful. But what makes them extra painful is the hopelessness of thinking that it's not going to end or it's not going to get better. That really yeah. is the difference between something being difficult and something being completely crushing, I think. Yeah, I tend to separate it uh, between like pain and suffering. Like pain is something that you can't really avoid. You know, like if you uh, fall off while climbing a tree and hurt yourself, there's nothing you can really do about that. It's just, it's like kind of painful. But if you're like focusing all your energy in there and you're like, ah, this is going to go away and you're fully into it, you're actually just like worrying yourself about how much is going to hurt the next second. Um, Sam Harris explains this very well that, you know, it's just the fear of it continuing. That's actually the suffering part. The basis of it is like, suffering is believing that you're not going to get out of this thing and it's, it's fighting the pain of just like i shouldn't be feeling this uh, i don't want to be feeling this this is uncomfortable i want to move on from this that's the suffering part like you fighting against yourself where if you're just like able to just be there and be like ow this is painful um okay it sucks it's okay i can be sad about this there's like a different uh, relationship with it being built about it. Basically, you just like enjoying being in pain. I, I definitely feel like I go through this process a lot of just like, if I need to cry and I'm like weeping and I'm screaming into my pillow, you know, I'm not like an emotionless robot. I go through this, but there's like an undertone voice of just been like, hey, I'm choosing to be here. It's okay. I need this right now. And yeah. that is what makes it feel like I'm not suffering, that I'm just like living through this emotion that's like running through me, but it's, I'm in control of it and I'm letting it out. Yeah. And you know, once it's gone on for a while, I can be like, Hey, this is no longer useful. Like you've done it now. You don't have to be stuck in it. So how, so, I def that definitely resonates in terms of acceptance and in terms of how different how our brain can translate a painful thought into one that's like we can't even deal with and becomes all encompassing. I know that I definitely experienced that with with depression, like how a sadness would lead to a depressive episode was I didn't realize at the time, but it was through these cycle of thoughts that made it hopeless and never ending as opposed to yeah opposed to a temporary experience. Um, I do feel that. Sometimes you can go through things that are considered very bad and terrible and be okay on the other side of, it's not just you rejecting it, it's just your body hasn't processed it as unfair and unjust and it shouldn't happen. I think a lot of times trauma can be from that comparison. And I think that ties with like part of the healing process of just like, okay, that's what it is. You can't actually change what happened. You can only change how you feel about it now. Mm. And so sometimes that involves making you feel 
unhappy about the situation first and then realizing that you can be happy or at least okay with the situation. Yeah, which I think ties back into what we were saying before about the journey and the time that it takes and being like being okay with the fact that it takes time and you have to go through these different stages to get to that point. Yeah, I think it's it's different stages to the thing. I don't think everybody should be pushed to face the deepest and most painful uh realizations you know i don't think it i think people do grow from that but i think it's also uh an unfair thing to push upon other people that don't choose it themselves yeah i suppose especially like again talking about time if you're not ready like we can i think there's a big thing in mental health which is that you know, a therapist is never going to tell you what to do. It's all about guiding you to find the answers and to get to that place yourself. And I think, yeah. and I think as uh, humans, naturally, we want, like you said, we want these shortcuts. We want to like fix it for someone else and like push them towards something, give them advice. And it's like, like you were just saying, if someone, when they come to that place themselves and that's their journey, then it's appropriate, but it's not necessarily appropriate to be pushing them down that road yeah very much i think if anyone's ever had the experience of dealing with an addict you cannot make them quit you can only just path the way of possible exits and so forth. you can just not push them even if the you know you and the person both know it's better for themselves it's it's only up to the person. I think it's a very human extension thing to have self-control, even if that self-control is you choosing not the fastest way into being in a better place and maybe just choosing to accept things about yourself that were very hard to accept, but it's easier than taking the road. I think that's also very valid. And I think that actually is something that gets quite stigmatized. Um, um, in my personal experience with my mother, actually, this was actually one of the hardest things of just like realizing that for me to be okay, I had to just accept that she wasn't like me and she didn't want to change. And empathizing uh, with the other side of just like, okay, they're not there. They, they might never be there. And that's okay. That doesn't mean they're like a full, complete, terrible human being, <laughs> you know, just because they don't make the choices that I would make or that are more beneficial for them. Um, it just means like, okay, this is an area that they struggle in, the same as I struggle in different areas. And where, and so, and where are you right now with your relationship with your, your mum? When you're and your healing journey yourself, like how are you? Do you feel like you've reached a point of conclusion with it, or do you feel like there's more still to go? No, I think it'll constantly be changing, and I think that's a nice thing that I've come to accept that how I feel about it will constantly be changing. Right now, I'm in a position that feels really healthy and really good for me. Um, it's not idyllic, uh, but it's just having had a few hard, difficult conversations with her that were very painful. Um, about what I felt was unjust and like pain to me and her like neglecting uh, to admit these things or taking a responsibility, you know, just accepting it, like, yeah, it happened, like move on without uh, maybe being sorry for wanting to make up for these things, which is what I definitely wanted for a long time. I've come to like accept that this, this is them. I, I want them to be another version of them, but this is them and this is what I get. And mm -hmm. so my relationship with my mom, even after all the terrible stuff she's done, it also involves a lot of good stuff that she's done and a lot of good stuff that she's um, taught me. And so just be grateful for those stuff and not be too judgy of the negative stuff. Just be like, she became this human because of the life experiences she had. And, you know, had I been her, I would have made probably the exact same choices. 
Um, so it's okay. She's not what I want her to be, but it's okay. Um, and so it's led me to a relationship with my mom of like less hope, less disappointment. Um, but it seems quite subtle, very like chill. There's no, there's not so much expectation from me. And, you know, when she reaches above that expectation, it's like, oh, that's really nice. But there's also not much hope uh, on my side. Uh, so there's not the the downside of just like, oh, she's let me down again. Mm. Um, for me, it's not the idyllic situation, of course. You know, I I think there's always this want of like, this person was just a little bit better at this. This, this would be perfect, which is, you know, a false uh, fallacy that we tell ourselves things would be perfect only if just maybe this thing was different nah yeah not at all um so i'm pretty okay with it now i don't feel emotionally tied to any of it i feel a little bit like the buddhist monk like very distant from it um which also in my world view is a little bit negative um but it is uh it's good for coping with how the situation is. Um, the truth is my mother is not reliable, so I don't rely on her. Would I want to? Of course, it would be amazing, you know, like when shit goes down to have like that reliable parent, like I'm gonna be here to support you and do whatever, but it's not. So, okay, what can I do with that? Nothing, just accept it. And that's kind of like a, a very nice chill place to be just like that's that yeah that's so am i going to be in the city forever i don't think so but i i couldn't tell you when the next stage is you know like just i, I like i couldn't tell you what tomorrow's weather is going to be like yeah of um but it no longer worries me and I'm, I'm no longer in this like suffering state um i'm very okay to experience pain because of it again it doesn't worry me that you know one day she's gonna do something terrible again and i'm gonna be like ah oh, why but i think i also might not be in the stage of like suffering of like life is unfair <laughs> yeah. just be like okay that was painful cool uh what's uh, the next hour gonna bring it, it makes me think of um the idea of of looking after yourself and self-care, the whole like put the mask on yourself before you can others, is that, and because what you were talking about before as well is about um, dealing with addicts, is that it's like we can have so much focus of like their negative behavior and what they're doing and wanting them to change that people can forget to look after themselves. And it sounds like what you've yeah. been doing is really focusing on to, to take the focus off of her and onto you and be like, how do I look after myself? How do I stop myself suffering? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it turned to because I don't have control over anything but me. And even me is difficult to control, I'm sure. <laughs> Most people have had these experiences of like, I'm going to get up early in the morning and I'm going to be productive, for example. And then, you know, a week goes by like, man, I had all intentions to do this and it didn't happen. What, why, why can I not talk to my brain the way it understands? I told you I'm going to do this. Why did you not do it? So <laughs> that's already a hard enough battle. It's, you don't need to put more into, you know, like your backpack of this like journey in finding control <laughs> of like hey, other people. That definitely resonates. I have no idea what's going on with myself and my own mind half the time, let alone what's going on in other people's heads. You can also be a great example of how to do things in a more helpful way without pushing it onto other people. So I think it's great to focus just on yourself, but you're still dealing with the external world. And so knowing how to maneuver in this external world, it's also a good lesson to learn. Definitely. And I, I think like you just said, being an example for people or people learning from your experience is something that definitely resonates with me and it's one of the reasons i wanted to have this conversation is that it's like 
I and I said this before, it's it's not that we're we either of us are the experts in mental health or of trauma or of how to recover from it kind of thing. But this is your experience and I want to thank you so much for being so open and brave and talking about these very difficult things and about sharing your journey because I think that even though everyone's experience is different, being able to hear your honest thoughts and account of what you've been through is going to be really wonderful for, for people. Um, yeah, so I want to thank you so much for talking with me today and for lending your face to this painting that is still in the ongoing stages. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there. that's quite the, the task you got yourself. Let's dive into a deep, meaningful subject while painting and being funny. Like, <laughs> pick yeah. two. Uh, yeah, I got two of them. <laughs> the dangerous the triangle. <laughs> I got the painting <laughs> of the deep conversation. Didn't quite manage the funny, but we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next time, it will just be like, comedic jokes and painting or just end up like no painting and just fun conversation yeah <laughs> fun we'll deep see. meaningful conversation we'll see this is a growing process as well um as everything is okay my worst bit is always starting the very first introduction bit i always feel really like silly about it's like what do you say <laughs> i also don't have a title for this series so maybe we should come up with a title right now talking mental art painting, <laughs> painting. healthy art talk <laughs> like, psychological painting TP. that sounds very trippy <laughs> Yeah, I imagine people. this is what exactly what people did, you know, like when they started Google. It's like a lot of people like us right now, but sitting in a room and they're just like, let's name it Goffle. No, no. Poodle. No. <laughs> My phone battery just uh, suggesting to me that it's low. Um, how, how polite of it. I would just like to suggest to you. Yeah. Well. <laughs> it wasn't informative that do you mind if i just yeah. let you know that uh, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> possibly <laughs> there could be in the near about. future <laughs> so you have an english phone then. yeah your phone is from the united kingdom then is what you're telling me yes <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it actually is i've got a phone guy from the uk there you go that's but yes uh, i think <laughs> is that Calvin Harris' um, brother? Wait, so you... Sorry? No, I was just making a pet. I was like, is that Calvin Harris' brother? Ah. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this idea. I'm oh, sorry, I don't get the reference. I was just kind of like. <laughs> no, I just. I, I, you were just like, no, nope, don't like that joke. Uh -huh. <laughs> How dare you just like, I'm right. not to like that joke. I just I was like, maybe he's quoting a film. I don't get it. <laughs> he's like a DJ. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. This isn't a comedy <laughs> special. We're talking about mental health. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making me feel awkward about like the sliding part of this <laughs> Slide pass. This is how people respond to my jokes a lot in real life too. They just like, oh. <laughs> oh, but uh, yeah. We're like talking about trauma can be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Release your emotions. Ah. <laughs>